Hey everybody, this is Pastor Clark. We're about five minutes away from the start of our worship service. I'm getting revved up and excited because this is the time we spend together to worship our Lord together. Would you make your final push to invite your friends to come on into the live feed? And I hope that you've been enjoying the playlist that we have this morning. It's uh, some of our favorite songs and some of the most influential songs around the country. And so we pray that these songs have been a blessing. But as we get ready for our worship service today, come on and invite a friend and let people know that you got church going on today. This is Pastor Clark. We're about two minutes away, two minutes in counting. As we finalize preparations to go live for our church service this morning, we pray that you come into the house of the Lord with the praise on your lips and the praise from the depths of your heart because God's been faithful and good. And get this, don't be selfish. Tell a friend to join you for worship service today because God has been good. He's been faithful to all of us. And so he is worthy of our praise and he's worthy of our thanksgiving. So let's worship the Lord together as we get ready to start service in less than two minutes.
Let's stand as we pray and as we get into the presence of God. He is certainly worthy to be praised, and I welcome you into the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you for joining me at home on Zoom, on Facebook. God is certainly faithful. Thank you for those who are in the room. He is faithful. He is just. He is kind. And so we would use this time to worship and to glorify his name. We stand and worship because we want to show our humility unto him. The Bible says that under his mighty hand, we humble ourselves, we submit ourselves because he's great. He is awesome. He is powerful. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He is our creator. So we humble ourselves in worship. We stand in prayer because we want to show him, Father, we are humble and our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed because our gifts and abilities and skills and our strength is not in comparison to what you do. We listen to the preached word of God because it allows us to hear his voice, for him to teach us, to show us what he wants us to do, and what he wants us to say, what he wants us to be, where he wants us to go. We live a life of worship. We live a life of focus. We live a life of holiness. We live a life of purpose as ongoing worship. Outside of the house of God, we are still called to be children of God. We're still called to raise his name. We're still called to praise his name. We're called to bring and usher in the holiness of God and the kingdom of God. And so we live the way we live. We glorify the way we glorify. We lift up the way we lift up because it is our act of worship. So Father, we thank you this morning for allowing us to be in your presence. Father, if the wind goes left, so will I. If the rocks cry out, so will I. Father, we will not be outdone by other creation because we have too much to say thank you for. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your show of mercy. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done and guided us through. Father, we bless your holy name. We bless your holy name because your purposes are yea and amen. We bless your holy name, Father, because you have driven us to where we are today. And we gladly say thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up Tanya, who's watching. Father, we ask, Father, that you bless her heart, release her mind, Father, ease her spirit. As she's searching for a church home and as she's searching for peace, 
as he's searching for understanding, as he's searching for acceptance, Father, would you release Tanya to see you standing right in front of her, Father? We pray for Stephanie's mother as she continues to heal, as she continues to recuperate. Father, we pray for those in our congregation, those a part of our extended family, those who we know and love who are struggling, those who are on Facebook who type in, amen, I need prayer. Father, we pray for them as well. For those that are typing in in Zoom, Father, we lift up their names, their families as well. Father, would you respond in this moment to them? Would you allow your peace that passes all understanding to respond to the heart's desires that are being typed in right now on Zoom and on Facebook? Father, would you transfer your peace to those who are in the room who are silently raising their concerns to you? Thank you, Father. We love you. We rely upon you. Our lives are dependent upon you. And Father, we trust you with our hearts. We trust you with our soul. We trust you with our very being. And we pray, Father, you not only feed us with your peace, but would you feed us with your word this morning? We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Let the people of God say amen and amen and amen. I'm so glad to see all of you in the house today. If you have a prayer request, go ahead and type it in as we're getting ready to preach the word of the Lord. I am so glad that we are here to be with each other today. Amen, amen, and amen. As you're getting ready to uh, type in your prayer request and as you're getting ready to hear the word of the Lord, I encourage you to go to uh, Live in Faith ct.org where you can find today's scripture again is livingfaithct.org and the scripture today can be found in genesis chapter 30 we got a couple of scriptures to read today as the lord has given us our assignment genesis chapter 30 verses 37 to 40 and then we're going to jump to proverbs 31 shortly after that and we'll give you those scriptures amen livingfaithct.org. Click on the scripture tab. You'll find the scriptures for today. Here's the first part of the word of the Lord that we're going to be reading. Genesis chapter 30, 37 through 40. It says this, then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set on the sticks, he set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks and the troughs that is, the watering place, where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. Verse 40, and Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks towards the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. We're going to jump to Proverbs chapter 31. We'll read two verses. Uh, this is known as the description of the Proverbs 31 woman. Here it is, uh, Proverbs 31, verse 16 and verse 24. Again, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 16 and 24. Here's the word of the Lord. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. Again, we welcome you to the house of the Lord. We welcome you to the church this morning. Uh, we're going to continue our series. We started last week. We talked about a path to correction and change. This is part two. Uh, the subtopic here is ownership and control. Uh, ownership and control. 
And this is for the entrepreneurs in the room, entrepreneurs on the line. And I know that we have a number of seniors who call in who are retired. God bless you. Some of us are really jealous of you. Uh, but as you hear this message, I want you to reflect on what was, what could have been. But also, I want you to hear a message that can go directly to your grandchildren, to your children, to your children's children, so on and so on. And I'm going to spend time talking about Jacob and the Proverbs 31 woman. We hear about these two characters quite a bit in church uh, sermons and Bible studies, but I want to go just a step further uh, in this topic, talking about ownership and control. Now, we continue to see uh, protests happening all over the country in response to George Floyd. Uh, even in our own cities and towns, we continue to see a response to this issue uh, about police brutality and the intersection between police brutality, police brutality and people of color, particularly black people. You see people of all colors and stripes marching. They're marching to their town centers, their city centers, their state capital. They are rallying. You see signs. You see children. You see adults. You see teenagers. You see older folks. You see black. You see white. You see everything in between. And what's interesting about this inflection point in our culture is that it is being observed. This is interesting. This is different from other times because of the age uh, diversity you see in the crowd. The age diversity and the race diversity you see in the crowd. So you see a lot of rallying, a lot of marches, and a lot of unification. This is being reported uh, on a regular basis on multiple platforms that the unification, the diversification, yet unification of those marching is an interesting observation, particularly people of a certain age who have lived long enough to see variations of these actions and activities and experiences are noticing that this is a little different. This smells different. This feels different. This is an interesting time in our country because of the unification, the unification of the community who struggling and the unification of allies, people who support, people who want to speak up on behalf of those who are struggling. With the engagement of allies, the effort to bring attention to gross uh, misjustice, uh, unjust activity is causing America to listen in a way that they have not before. It's interesting, you see, particularly in the sports world, where Drew Brees was called out for a statement that came out quite naturally. And it came out naturally because, according to many, that he believes what he spoke the first time, that there should be no disrespect of the flag. There are many people who say uh, that there really isn't any racism, even in sports or in our politics or in our little small fiefdom. But the truth is that it does exist. It's implicit, sometimes explicit. It's systemic. It exists. It's there. And it's difficult to see it if you are of the majority, of if you are the one on top. Uh, see, when you are winning, you don't see the plight of those who are losing. Uh, you only see everything around you and everything that impacts you. Uh, when you are ahead, uh, you don't look at those who are behind. Uh, even in scripture, Paul says, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling that's ahead of me. I, I leave behind. We preached this several weeks back. I leave behind my past. It is a natural human behavior to not look behind you and grab what you left behind. Now, if it's a spiritual principle that's true, then it is also true that when you are of a majority group or community, you will not see, understand, experience what others are experiencing because you're not a part of the bottom. Men don't see all that women struggle with because women are still considered at the bottom. Uh, when you're white, you don't see all that people of color struggle with at the bottom. When you get a couple of dollars in your bank account, you don't see the struggle at the bottom. This is why scripture talks about the treatment of all people, classes, creed, race, etc., must be of God. If you're rich, you're responsible for the equal treatment of those who are poor. If you are of one culture, you are responsible for the equal and best treatment of those who are of a different culture. Male, female, no matter who you are, you ought to be treated equally. This is, this is how we live. This is the scriptural foundation. So we see this truth showing up 
in our culture. And if you are of the type who is rallying and marching, God bless you, because there needs to be a voice brought to this issue. There needs to be attention brought to that issue. The news reports say that it has been more than almost two weeks since the death of George Floyd, and the rallies and protests have gotten nothing but bigger. Uh, they claim that, that, that the marches have gotten more boisterous, more, more supporters. Uh, uh, people are gra- gathering in droves, which is the antithesis of what has happened in the past, where we, we were marched and we were hit it hard for one day, two days. And by day three, we're back to normal, desensitized to whatever's happening. It doesn't seem to be the case anymore. People are speaking up in ways that they never have before. People are speaking their truth, the truth, in a way that they never have before. And because they are doing it, the boldness of our culture is coming up. Perhaps this is what they call the American spirit is bubbling up. Now, as I told you last week, I am not the marching rah rah rallying type. You will never, you will rarely see me, if ever, see me marching. Uh, But God bless those who are doing it. But my calling, my purpose is to equip people of God uh, to do something different, right? Uh, Once the marching is done, once the rallying is done, once everybody puts the picket signs away, uh, there still has to be some work to be done, right? We have to take action. We have to open doors. My calling, my purpose is to equip God's people to do just that. As things begin to change, as ways begin to be made, as doors begin to open, you as believers watching me on Zoom, listening to me on the phone call, watching me on Facebook, you need to be equipped to do something about the open door that's coming. What good is it for the Lord to open up a window of blessing and pour out blessings you can't contain and you are not ready to at least pretend to receive it? Amen, Pastor. (laughs) What good is it if somebody wants to give you a million dollars and you don't have a bank account? What you want, hide it in your mattress? It doesn't work. You got to be ready to receive what God is getting ready to do and give you, especially if you are going to answer the calling of responsibility and leadership. This particular message uh, is talking about ownership and control. I'm I'm talking about entrepreneurship today. Last week, we talked about leadership from the lens of Joseph and his ability to not only carve out leadership roles for him to usher in kingdom access and control, he also negotiated kingdom access for middle managers. There is a role for leaders to play who are going to open up doors and access. And then there's part two. Today, we're going to talk about ownership and control, particularly entrepreneurship. But before I go into this sermon, let me be honest with you. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Do not listen to this sermon feeling guilty or bad about what is or what I'm about to say. It is not for everybody. Entrepreneurship is for people who want to tell the world that I am responsible for the creation and the delineation of a product or service. Entrepreneurship is for people who want to say to the world, I'm my own person. I make my own money. I have my own staff. I have my own hours. I do what I want, when I want, how I want, and I will support my lifestyle appropriately. Again, let me put you at ease. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. If you're called to be an entrepreneur, you're called to take responsibility over your finances in a way that you don't have control over it as an employee. When you are an employee, you negotiate your salary if given the opportunity and you receive a steady check, the same amount every week or every two weeks or every month from your employer. As long as your your employment is not terminated, you will continue to receive that same check every week, every two weeks, or every month. The challenge with that is not getting fired. 
<laughs> not losing your job. Now, I don't know about you, but I've lost a job before. I've been terminated before. I've lost income before. And when you lose your money, when you lose your paycheck, uh, anxiety sets in because you don't know what's going to happen two, four weeks from now when you don't have that steady check coming in. So, so you're at the mercy of someone when you are an employee. An entrepreneur takes ownership of their business and says that I am going to own control. I'm going to leverage all that I am, all that I have to dictate what will and will not happen to me. If I get fired, it's because I go out of business. If I lose my income, it's because I didn't sell enough. If I don't make enough money, it's because I didn't market enough. Not because somebody told me what to do and I didn't do it and they terminated me as a result. No, it's going to fall and rise on my shoulders and on my back. The proper definition of an entrepreneur is someone who organizes and operates businesses and takes on greater financial risk than in normal times. In layman's terms, an entrepreneur is someone who puts up the money, who fronts the money, who tells everyone that's watching, I am responsible and I will be the 100% recipient of the revenue that comes in after I pay the bills, I cut the check, I find and pay the staff. That is the proper definition of an entrepreneur. Now, many of you on this call, many of you watching me are budding entrepreneurs. Some of you are full-fledged entrepreneurs. Some of you are thinking about it. There is Christian and biblical value for even thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. There's a reason why you may be thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. Maybe it's because in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 to 28, the Bible says that God created us to have dominion, control, leverage, responsibility over the earth. You were designed in the very beginning to be the one leveraging, leading, controlling, owning, directing the resources within your sphere of influence. When sin crept in, we lost the privilege to think like free people, and we became bondaged to sin. Therefore, God created a burden of work on us that did not exist in the beginning of our design. We were designed to be kings and queens of the most high children of God, and yet when sin crept in, we were created or we transitioned to a debased way of thinking. You are a son and a daughter of the God of all gods. Hear me good. You are the offspring of the greatest creator of all time. The greatest innovator known to history is your daddy. The greatest strategist known to mankind is your father, which is in heaven. The one we worship, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, he is the one we worship. And if we are made in his image, then we also should have the resources and capability that he has. And the church is silent because culturally we've been conditioned to not think like God. We've been conditioned to respond to the flesh and to do whatever someone else tells us to do, therefore losing the opportunity to be like God and create. Your most basic function as a man and as a woman is to create. At the most basic level, you are gifted and skilled and created to create children, offspring, babies, other humans. That should tell you that you are gifted to do more than just do what somebody else tells you to do. <laughs> you got it within your genes to create. You're biologically wired to create. You're intellectually capable to create. And you can create more than just babies. 
when he gave us dominion over the resources of the earth, he gave us the ability to see what doesn't exist, to create what has yet to come into existence. We, we created furniture out of the resources of this earth. We, we create all types of food, all types of delicacies out of the resources of, these, of this earth. We create all types of real estate, houses, etc., out of the resources of this earth. We were gifted with the ability to have dominion. Perhaps you feel called to be an entrepreneur because of this scripture, Romans 13 and 8. I remember when I first read this from the lens of a business owner, it changed everything. Paul says, oh, no man, nothing but love. Oh, no man, nothing but love. When you love somebody, you fulfill the law. We feel obligated to work for someone else and we create this subservient relationship with our employer, therefore feeling like we owe them something. Many of us go to work immediately after graduating from school because of the massive amounts of debt that we have, and therefore we need immediate ways to pay off this debt, and we do it through employment. The burden of debt causes us to live beneath the calling that exists for all of us as believers. The lender is a slave to the borrower. Don't pay your bills and find out what happened. Don't pay a light bill, see if you can turn on the light. It's almost summertime and you have no electricity going through your house. Don't pay your bill. Let me know if the fan still works. Let me know if the air conditioner still works. Uh, the lender is a slave to the borrower. Don't pay your student loan debt. Let me know how that turns out. Let me know the next time you get approved for a credit card or a new car loan or a home loan or a job even. The lender is a slave to the borrower. And yet Paul writes that you are to owe no man nothing but love. And yet culturally, we continuously get into debt creating multiple subservient relationships that force us to get jobs working for someone else. This, this is deep. The pressure to pay a bill forces you to get a job, begging for a job, interviewing for a job, looking your best making sure your shirt is ironed, making sure your hair is cut, your hair is done, making sure you're smelling good, making sure you speak with all perfect diction, trying to convince someone that you are the man or the woman for the job because of pressure you have. And you create limited options for yourself because of debt. You don't even give your chance, yourself a chance to do anything greater than that because of debt. Listen, this is, this is not a rebuke because I've been there, done that. Been there, got the t-shirt, the headband, the matching socks. My wife and I have lived that life. We know what it's like. Been there, done that. I know what it feels like. Those options become few. And yet Paul says, uh, oh, no man, nothing but love. Perhaps you want to be an entrepreneur because you don't want to owe nobody nothing except I love you and keep it moving. I quoted the scripture before, but it's worth saying again, perhaps you want to be an entrepreneur for this third scriptural reason, uh, Proverbs 22 and 7. The rich rule over the poor. <laughs> I don't think that needs a deep theological explanation. It's kind of understood what that means. The rich rule over the poor, right? And here's the B clause, and the bow borrower is a slave of the lender. You're going to work to pay your bills. It's, it's beaten into your psyche to pay bills. Some of us struggle to miss a bill or to be a day late. It is within us to pay our bills. Having ownership, having control, being an entrepreneur gives you and I freedom. Having ownership, Having control gives you and I freedom. 
when, when we moved to Connecticut, uh, I sold my real estate in Philadelphia before I left and came here. One of the happiest days of my life was obviously reconnecting with my family. But then the next thing that happened was I paid off my car note. And uh, I had the car for probably about six months. And the feeling of paying off a car note is, is second to none. Now, younger folks don't know nothing about that because they're all about getting new vehicles and, and looking fresh and been there, done that. Uh, but, but once you get a certain age, you realize a car note is for the birds. Uh, all, all the older folks, somebody text me, amen. Uh, yeah, there you go. It, it, is, it, is, it is for the birds. And the reality is, that debt creates a burden. That debt of a vehicle creates a burden that has to be paid back at some point. Being free means you owe nobody nothing. Me and Pastor Bruce, we, we linked up the other day. We were talking about this very, this very thing. Uh, when, when, I, when I don't have a car note, I don't have to pay the, more, the note on it. I can maintenance the car whenever I want to. I can put as much or as little gas as I want to. I can treat the car however I want because guess what? It's mine. Ownership and control gives you freedom. Many believers struggle to envision freedom because they don't know what it's like to live outside of the struggle. They don't know what it's like to live outside of the moment of owing somebody something. For years, we've come to church broke and frustrated, asking God for miracles because we're used to the struggle. We were sold a bill of goods that said that the struggle is a badge of honor as we become disciples of Christ. No, no, no. It's a misunderstanding of the text. And consequently, many of us can't see beyond this moment. As I'm preaching, I know that what I'm saying so far is a struggle for you to even envision because the next question you're asking me is how? which I'm going to get to, but, but you ask me how? How do I do that when I owe so much money? How do I do that when I'm still living at home with my mom? How do I do that when I got a $20,000 car note and I just got it and I don't know what else to do? How do I do that when I haven't been to college yet or I haven't graduated from school yet or I haven't gotten a certification yet? How do I do that in my current state? There's a thing called faith. There's a thing called faith, a faith that means we put one step in front of the other, believing that God is going to reveal the pathway we are called to take. Are you ready to express and explore faith? It is hard to say, God, I believe you for what I can't see. It's easy to say, God, I thank you for what I do see. We can march and we can complain and we can rally and talk about what we don't like and what we want to change. And yet this pandemic of uh, epic proportions, the news cycle has opened our eyes to realize that opportunity is literally right here. Several weeks back, I preached to you, all you got to do is just reach out to hands and grab whatever's in front of you. I'm leaving behind and I'm grabbing a hold of what's in front of me. Are you ready to take that step of faith? Are you ready to start to look at the process of owning and controlling and leveraging and being your own man and your own woman? Who, according to scriptures, serves other children of God as if you're serving God yourself. It's available to you. So, it's time for us to take a step forward. There's much more I wanted to say about the rap marching and rallying and everything else about the church, but I think others have said it. But let me dig you, take you deeper into where we need to be. 
as I begin to explore the word of the Lord with you regarding Jacob and the Proverbs 31 woman, I need you to begin to think about where God is calling you to own and control, what he wants you to own and control. It must be a natural fit for how you are designed and how you are wired. Maybe it is owning and controlling real estate. Maybe it is owning and controlling businesses. Perhaps you're called to own and control nonprofits and ministries. Maybe you're called to own and control politics in your area of influence. Maybe you're called to own and control the education of your children. Shout out to the homeschooling moms. Maybe you're called to own the economic future of your family and generations to come. And maybe we're all called to own the ushering in of the kingdom of God within our communities. That's peace, joy, and love in the Holy Ghost. There is no peace, love, and joy when you owe money. When you're in massive debt, you rarely have peace. Some of us can't sleep because we think about debt. We dream about debt. We dream about getting up at, in the morning to go to work, work the first job, the second job, and half of a third job just to make the ends meet. There is no peace when somebody's calling your phone while you're on a date with your girl. And it ain't your mom checking up on you. It's the call, customer service calling you, asking when you're going to pay your bill. There is no peace. When you hop in your car and you realize, I can only put $5 of gas in my, car, my gas tank because I got to raise it. I saved the rest to pay my bill. Where's the peace? Somebody tell me, where, where's the peace? Ain't none. Love, joy, peace, and the Holy Ghost. That, that, that is the goal. I first said a scripture. I want to explore Jacob. Genesis chapter 30, verse 37 to 40. Now, what you should know about Jacob is he's the daddy of Joseph. If you were here last week, you heard about his son. You heard about what his son did, his, what his son exposed, what his son created through leadership in, in Egypt. You heard about him, and we preached about him. Now you're about to hear about Joseph's daddy. Now, Abra, uh, Jacob, rather, uh, he uh, wanted a wife. And this is where I'll begin the story. There's more uh, to his life before this. But he wanted a wife. His mama told him to go to her, her brother, his uncle, and go and get a wife from one of his daughters. He went there and fell in love with a woman called Rachel. He loved her dearly. And he made an agreement with Laban and said, if I work for you for seven years, will you give me your daughter's hand in marriage? When you are in love, you will do just about anything for the woman you love. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the headband. Love will make you not think straight. Love will, <laughs> he said, yep. Yeah. Love will make you run in blind. He agreed to terms that probably weren't as favorable because he fell in love with this woman. According to scripture, after year seven, he went to Laban and said, yo, man, give me my wife. I want my wife. You know what it's like? If, if, you, if you've been a, a celibate and you've been dating your girl and it's time to get married and you know when you get married, it's time when you get together and make love. It, it's like her father saying, mm, yeah, not yet. That's what happened. He, he couldn't have his wife and the benefits of marriage because her daddy played a game and said, well, listen, our custom is in order for you to marry the one you want, Rachel was the youngest, you got to marry the oldest one, Leah. She wasn't as cute. She wasn't pretty. <laughs> she wasn't the one he wanted. Laban played him. And as a result, Jacob had to work another seven years just to get the woman he wanted. That is tough to work 14 years just to get the one you want and then you have to marry the one you don't want because she ain't that cute. He went through all of that. Then he had all these children. And then he started to think, all right, now it's time for me to go out on my own. And my manhood must be put on display so I can provide for my children for my wives and for my flock. 
He goes to Laban and says, listen, give me what is due to me. And Laban says, oh, okay. Now, you should know about this time that Laban has changed the wages of Jacob multiple times, and Jacob knew that Laban was not on the up and up. One of the questions we ask ourselves is, the Bible talks about transferring the wealth of the wicked to the righteous, and sometimes we just don't know what that means. Here's a scriptural reference of how all of this worked. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 37, it says, then Jacob, once he agreed to the terms with Laban, he said, and the terms were this, give me all the spotted and a speckled calves, which were considered weaker than the ones who had a clear coat or a consistent coat. And Laban thought that was a good deal. Here's what the Bible says, verse 37, then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white to the sticks. Verse 38, he set the sticks uh, that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is the water in place, because where they came to drink is where they came to breed. Every time the cows, cows and the goats came to get something to drink, that's when they breeded. Jacob learned that when they saw the sticks, it somehow influenced the cows and the goats to produce babies that had spots. This was a revelation he received from God. He not only received this revelation, but he tested this theory he got from God and realized that this theory works. He took it a step further and said that not only will I employ this theory and have them produce babies with spots, I'm only going to make the strongest cows with my cows so that I can produce strong babies. Given the opportunity, given the leverage, he created wealth while working for someone else. It seems impossible to create your own space, your own lane, your own business when you're working for someone else. But, but Jacob is showing by example, it is more than possible if you just open up your eyes and become creative. Note this, the agreement was that he was to receive all the spotted cows and the speckled cows and the cows with stripes because of the assumption that they were weaker than those who had a consistent coat. What would it look like if Jacob created his own breed of cow that had spots and stripes but were stronger than the ones that Laban got? What you get six years later is a man who was once poor, now wealthy. These jobs that we have, where we work, where we spend our time, Yes, we're there because our options are, are limited. Yeah, we're there because we have debt and we have responsibilities and we feel the pressure. But can I just tell you something? This is a revelation for some of you. Your job is a place to get paid to learn. If you are wasting your time at your job complaining, frustrated at who's doing what, not doing what, who's coming to work late, who's doing this and that and third, and not really mastering your craft, you're missing the transfer. You're missing the transfer. You get paid to get better. You get paid to be a master craftsman. But you waste your time gossiping about Susie and Joe and miss the opportunity to master your craft. If Jacob didn't master his craft, how would he be able to negotiate terms that were ultimately favorable to him? The entrepreneur, the one that owns and controls, learns from their current situation. They master where they are and they leverage it to create something totally different. Perhaps the word of the Lord for some of you is to stop being lazy. Perhaps the word of the Lord for some of you is to stop complaining. Perhaps the word of the Lord for some of you is to try something different. How about go to work with a better attitude? 
How about volunteer to do more and not get paid more? How about you try something different at the expense of your boss that will benefit your boss initially, but may benefit you in the long run? You got to look at things different. You can march. Cool. You can storm the Capitol. That, that's, that's great. But, but how can you create a different pathway for you and yours if you're not in control? What was Jacob's entrepreneurial skills? He learned botany. He learned how the, the seasons of flowers and grass and trees benefited and harmed his cattle. He also learned zoology. He learned how to take care of his cows, his animals, his flock, because that was a sign of wealth. He learned the skill of psychology how to deal with people and their different mindsets. He knew his uncle didn't pay attention to the day-to-day -day operations. And lastly, he learned how to negotiate. All while working for his uncle for 20 years. You wanna know how to make that leap from where you are to being in control? You have to learn from where you are right now. The bread of affliction and the water of adversity is not just pain points that sting you at a specific time. They are teachers. Affliction is an educator. Adversity is a prophet. Affliction is a coach. Adversity is a teacher. Are you even listening to what God is saying to you? Have you been listening to what God has been speaking to you all these years? It took him 20 years to get to this point. You're only five years in. Are you even listening? You're called to do more than what you're doing now. And here's the result of all this. Wealth was transferred from his uncle to him, and God blessed him. but the story isn't over. Proverbs 31 woman is a description of the biblical woman that every man wishes he could marry. The Proverbs 31 woman is the woman when I was growing up that we taught was the ideal woman, the woman who engaged and invested in her household and she was everything to her children and her husband. It was the, the ideal quintessential woman and what it meant to be a woman in today's time. If that is true, then I wanted to call out two particular verses of this ideal woman that accentuates the point of being in control and owning. For those of you who think that being an entrepreneur is just a man's world, uh, you're biblically out of context and you're sadly mistaken. For those of you who think that I'm a woman and I can't do what they do, or I can't be what they are, or I'm not called to that because it just doesn't feel right. Can I just correct you biblically? You're wrong. Proverbs 31 woman was a special woman. There are elements to her character that you should read and to understand, but listen to this in Proverbs 31 and 16 and 24. Look at this. She considers a field and buys it. For all the women listening to me, the scripture said she considers a field. It didn't say her and her husband. It said that she considered uh, the field. Now, now, before you go off for me, don't, don't get it twisted. The Proverbs 31 woman uplifted her husband. She was behind him. She was next to him. She was there with him. She was a part of his journey. So don't get it twisted. But the text says specifically she considered a field and buys it. And the B clause says, with the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Do you know what she was into? Have you figured out what this woman was into? She was into real estate. She was into investing. She was into acquiring land, land that can reproduce fruit, land that can reproduce resources. She considered it 
She made the investment. And then the B clause says that by the hands of her fruit, by the fruit of her hands, she created a vineyard to no doubt provide for her children and her husband, but then to also sell in the marketplace. This is not a sermon just for men and for males. This is for women as well. God has called you to not only be in leadership positions, there are countless biblical examples of women in leadership, but he's called you to be in control and to own resources too. The reason why the husband can look at his wife in Proverbs 31 and call her blessed is because she was just as good as he was in business. She was just as convicted as he was in the moral causes that she pursued. She cared about the family just like he did, and she made the right investments to make sure the family was solid. She considered a field and purchased it. Don't tell me your gender is something that will hold you back. No. Nah. It got nothing to do with your gender. You're free. You have dominion just like Adam. Go forth and be. Proverbs 31, 24 says, she makes. She creates. She designs linen garments and get this this is what scripture says and then she sells it jacob did botany and zoology to create his wealth this woman does real estate and she's into fashion she sells garment and then it says she delivers sashes to the merchant. Do you know what she was into besides fashion? She was into wholesaling. That means that she was the first stop for a retailer before the stuff went to the market. This idea of creating change and having a pathway forward for our culture for our communities, for our children, and our children's children must begin with each of you desiring to be in control and to own something. And then the result of her exploits was her having residual income. She was a good woman. She was a smart woman. She was an investing woman. She was a strategic woman. Proverbs 31 says that her children rose up and called her blessed. Her husband sang her praises because of how awesome she was. Let me ask you a series of questions before we wrap this up. What could you do different if God blessed you with a transfer of wealth right now? What could you do that will be impactful if you made solid investments and had trading partners? How many lives could you change besides your own if you were able to hire people to work in your business and teach them how to do what you do? How different would your community be if you were able to be an influential stalwart that provided an example and a pathway of what godly success looks like. There are young people where you live who are lost. They have no idea what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be successful, what it means to find your purpose, what it means to live in purpose. There are people who are so-called your friends who are your age and they feel the same exact way. They feel lost. And yet we're marching and we're protesting for good reason 
but we can't help nobody outside of yelling and screaming. You want to change your community, lead. Be like Joseph and lead. Create doors for open, open doors for other people. You want to change your community, create jobs from your business. Pastor, I don't know where to get started. I can't get alone. Don't worry about it. Go to work every day and master your craft. Learn what you like, what you don't like. Take the time to get educated. Allow yourself to master your craft and to practice year after year after year after year and allow God and allow your faith to unlock the pathway forward towards ownership. Maybe you'll own a bunch of real estate and keep your regular job and hire some young adults to cut your grass. Maybe you'll encourage them to start companies that will manicure your lawns, maintenance your buildings, collect your rent, find your tenants. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you who needs to keep your regular job or open up a salon where you teach young adults how to do hair and how to take care of customers giving them a skill and an ability and teaching them to watch this, create their own salons with an S. Maybe you're a techie person and you got the next big tech idea. Who knows? You go to work every day, head down, grinding and grinding and grinding, and you make a discovery. Maybe it's you who's next blowing up. And with the opportunity to teach others how to do what you do. The reason why Jesus was able to be powerful and to create disciples was because he mastered his craft, how to be fishers of men. He mastered the craft of how to be a teacher of the Bible. And watch this, and I hope you guys are hearing me good. He mastered the craft of allowing people to be around him, to learn from him. A disciple is a student of a teacher. In order for you to change lives, you got to get out of your shell. You got to stop being quiet and shy and allow people in your space so they can learn from you and they can ask questions of you. So you can teach them and show them and open doors and make connections and change lives. It was the rumors of Jesus that caused people's lives to be changed. They heard what he did for so-and-so. They heard how he healed the sick and raised the dead. And the rumors kept spreading and spreading and spreading. And everywhere he went, there was a crowd watching listening and learning. You can't do that working for somebody else. You, you can't teach somebody something when you don't have nothing to teach them with. When you don't own something, you can't share what you have as much as you would like. You can only give but so much when you are an employee, but when you own, when you own, you can give away as much as you want, knowing I have the power to make that back and then some. And watch this, and I believe God will make it happen. The leverage and the freedom you have and the freedom of faith you have when you own your own stuff is totally different when you are an owner. I know this sermon might have went over some people's heads. I know this might have been a tough listen. But if you want to have change in your community, if you want to see things change around you, own stuff. Create a legacy for your family and own stuff. So when you die and hopefully go to heaven, you pass down earthly treasures along with the spiritual treasures to your children and your children's children, and it creates a tradition in a tradition of wealth. I dare you 
to start that process today. You're not too old, you're not too young. Before you know it, 10 years would have gone by. And just like the parable in Matthew 25, the owner comes back from his trip and he asks his servants, what fruit have you produced? I gave you five, what have you produced? I gave you two, what have you produced? I gave you one, what do you produce? You wanna be able to tell somebody before you take your last breath, I started out with one dollar. And when I take my last breath, I was able to pass along this, this thing of substance. Whew. I pray that the Lord blesses you all. I pray for some of you where if this went over your head that you replay this message because it is necessary to hear. It is a requirement for your faith. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the opportunity to study and to learn under you. We thank you for the opportunity to be disciples. We don't take for granted the opportunity that we have to access your scriptures. You wrote these things aforetime for our learning. And Father, what greater time to learn than now? Father, don't let us go. Don't let us stop learning. Don't let us stop getting educated. Don't let us stop uh, growing as people, as disciples. But Father, keep us focused on the calling at hand. Allow us, Father, the opportunity to be free, to be free from debt, to be free from uh, being slaves to other people so that we can be free to serve you. Father, would you release burdens today? For those who have been thinking about starting a business and just don't know how, Father, would you bless them to be encouraged to start this day, tonight, right now? For those that are, have never considered it but now want to at least think about it, Father, would you release them to think freely, to allow their minds to freely explore and to process possibilities? What could be? What could I do? What can I do? What am I good, good at? What am I good enough to do? Father, would you speak to that? Would you blow on that? For those who are still employees and going to work every day, would you bless them with the spirit of excellence to go and serve those they work for as if they're serving you, but to keep their eyes open to learn and to observe and to master their craft? Father, we trust you with our hearts our lives, and our very being. And Father, we want to live worthy of your trust to be kingdom influencers, to introduce the kingdom, and to be kingdom-minded in all that we do. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. If you have a love gift, please feel free to leave it online. We do uh, have an online mechanism. You can go to livingfaithct.org. Again, that's livingfaith ct.org. You can leave your gift via Cash App. You can leave your gift via Tithely, and the, we will be able to accommodate accordingly. Again, that's livingfaithct.org. If you want to mail your offering in, God bless those who have been mailing in. Ms. Laura, we love you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Friend, we thank you so much for you mailing your offerings in. But if you want to mail your offering in, mail it to Live in Faith Church. That's Living Faith Church, care of Dr. William Clark. Care of Dr. William Clark. And the address is 75 Charter Oak Avenue. Again, that's 75 Charter Oak Avenue. That's Hartford, a suite 1-301. Suite 1-301, uh, Hartford, Connecticut. And that's 06106. Again, that's 06106. For those on Zoom, my wife is typing in the information. Uh, I'm just uh, looking at comments here before we let you go and ask people to giving. Uh, Stephanie says she has a praise report. Wow, Stephanie, praise God. Um, before I read this report, um, I just need to share with you, uh, Stephanie's mother uh, is in Jamaica. Obviously, Stephanie's here in the States and given travel restrictions, it's difficult to get back and forth. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet Stephanie's mother several months ago. I think you, you met her too for Bible study. And uh, Stephanie called about a week, a week or two ago and stated that she believed her mother had an episode with COVID. And as you know, uh, people of a certain age struggle with COVID. 
Uh, come to find out when they rushed, rushed her mother to the hospital, uh, the doctors confirmed that her mother did not have a COVID case, which is a praise report. But then the problem was her mother had a heart attack and a stroke at the same time. And for a woman of a certain age, a person of a certain age, that is scary. And Stephanie, who was here in the States working on the front lines as a nurse, could not be there in person. Uh, as of yesterday or a couple of days ago, Stephanie was just texting and telling my wife and I that her mother still has not been able to move. Uh, Stephanie messaged us this morning and says, I'm going to read it verbatim. Uh, thank you for sharing this, Stephanie. I have a praise report. My mother walked out of the hospital yesterday. My God did a suddenly... Amen. My God did a sudden move. Uh, she went there not being able to walk. She was in a hospital bed for six days. And yes, Lord, she walked out. So Stephanie, uh, uh, God bless you. God is, God is good. He is amazing. I also know that probably two weeks ago now, Art Sr. was able to walk out of the hospital. He was um, uh, in the hospital for quite a, quite a while. He had a serious case of COVID, was uh, in a coma and the Lord blessed him to walk home. And so God is faithful, he is just, he is kind, he is a healing God. And so we thank God for those testimonies. And as you continue to give and wrap up your giving, I wanna thank you for investing in this ministry. There are so many things uh, we, we wanna do. There are things on the horizon that my wife and I are planning for this ministry and we can't do it without you. So we thank you for your love gifts. We thank you for your tithing. We are a tithing church. We believe in tithing because God, he blesses a cheerful giver and he opens up the doors of the windows of heaven and pours out blessings because of our giving. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and pray over these gifts and we'll dismiss for this day. Father, we thank you for those who gave. We thank you for the kindness of their hearts to give. And we thank you for the plentiness that you've given us to give. Father, we pray that you bless these tithes and offerings, those that have been given online, those that have been given in person, those that are being sent in the envelope as we speak. We pray blessings over that, Father, that you return it 30, 60, and 100 fold to the giver. We also pray, Father, that you bless this ministry to be great and amazing stewards. Bless us to be faithful stewards over these gifts. Bless us to do amazing things for your glory. Bless this ministry to open doors. Bless this ministry to be entrepreneurial to create opportunities for this community. Bless this ministry to invest and to build and to create. Bless this ministry to be what we preached about today, entrepreneurs, owners, creators, and leveragers. And Father, we believe that it is so. We believe it because you said it to be so. And we pray in the precious name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Uh, I will hang out for a little bit on Facebook and Zoom to text, etc. Uh, you can click off whenever you want to, but God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday for church.